Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to what might be the most controversial episode of the Star Trek Critic. Not because it started with a shuttlecraft lurching through space instead of the Enterprise, but of the subtle content that has been sneaked into this episode. Metamorphosis. An ambassador trying to negotiate a peace treaty gets a deadly disease, then gets whisked away for a new mission. We will never learn what Spock did for Kirk. But here you see Kirk bullying McCoy for his milk money. Most likely Spock gave in. This is the disease she has. The commissioner blames their medical department for not giving her the shot. And the first point is lost for not calling for a starship that can either bring her the vaccine at warp speed or take her to the base at warp speed. Considering how rare this disease is, it is quite possible this warring planet hasn't bothered to create or store a vaccine for a human that gets it. And twice in a row somebody says, THE Starfleet, not just Starfleet. This planet has war and disease, just like Earth 2020. And she says, THE Starfleet a third time. She is really pissy in this episode. Hard to believe she was Ellie Mae on The Andy Griffiths Show. It would have been better if the Enterprise went straight to the planet. Spock notices something, and Kirk tries to see it with his magic 8-ball. And the 8-ball didn't give him his wish. Aww. There is no way the companion travels at warp speed, or that they can see it like this at warp speed, so minus one point. One thing you don't know is how long the creature has been out in space looking for people, or how far away it is from its home. Sorry, spoiler alert, from her home. But neither the cloud or the shuttlecraft are traveling at warp speed. Actually, it has them. I have this urge to tell Kirk there are no buildings in space. Spock wants to do this scene over. Miss Hedford is a 23rd century backseat driver. Kirk looks a little pissed at it right now. The companion lures them in with disco lights. One of these days I want to learn how they map space in the future. Here is the planetoid they find, and whenever I get a screenshot of Spock, his eyes are closed. One point is lost for using Fahrenheit instead of Celsius. The next point is lost for landing in a cave. That's impossible. This line is foreshadowing Star Trek IV. Come in, please. Come in, please. While they debate whether the Commissioner should stay inside, you wonder, why are there two sets of shadows in the shuttlecraft? There must be more than one Galileo shuttlecraft because the one last year got destroyed. Kirk looks like he's going into battle. Look, it's Charlie's Angels. <laughs> McCoy plays the role of Red Shirt this time. Usually I take a point for the captain and first officer being on the same mission, but this was a diplomatic mission instead of a random planet mission, which has different rules. To make a long story short, Spock can't figure out what is wrong with the shuttlecraft, and McCoy says the cloud is here. The reason is the cloud brought you here and you are stuck. McCoy describes the cloud creature as being a giant fart. The ambassador broke quarantine. Here comes the mystery man. He hasn't seen other humans in almost 75 years. He's so happy, he starts skipping. Number 6 asks the same question. Kirk also quotes from Battlestar Galactica. Cochran introduces himself. He doesn't say his first name, and he recognizes Spock as a Vulcan. You can tell that even in the 1960s, they had the movie planned. I don't think so. Then Kirk introduces Cochran to Commissioner Hedford. Of course, he hasn't seen a woman in a buttload of years, so he responds with, food to a starving man. Then he says, all of you, is he bisexual or a cannibal? We will never know. <laughs> Cochran says they're stuck here. Here is where Cochran lies to Kirk. He knows why they are here. You'd think that after 75 years of being marooned on this planet, he could have come up with a better pickup line. What he really meant is that he wants to see her naked. <laughs> they check for this disease the same way you check for the coronavirus. The backstory is that Cochran was old and looking for a retirement planet where he can drink all day and tell stories of the Borg during first contact, so it is believable that his ship was designed to convert into a house. That's what happened to covered wagons in the old pioneer days, plus he's had 150 years to make it look this good. Kirk calls the old instruments antiques. Cochran says things have probably changed in all these years, but then Kirk says not that much. Didn't he just call them antiques? Then again, he doesn't really know how long Cochran has been here. Cochran uses Fahrenheit, but he came from a different time period, too. Now she's pissed. Dr. McCoy uses the 20th century prescription. You're tired. Get some rest. Captain Doctor must be a new rank. Spock notices, out on the yard, there's the entity that brought them to the planet. It takes a while for Kirk to get the actual story out of Cochran. But in a nutshell, the companion brought him here, too, and he stopped aging. Of course, now Kirk needs to do his one-up and talk about his trip to the Fountain of Youth. 
It's about time he asked this question. Of course, most people ask, what is your first name? Oh my gosh, they finally figured it out. He is Zephram Cochran, creator of the Space Warp. Yes, he created the first marble roller coaster. Did he move to Alpha Centauri later in life? There is no way anyone from Earth knew about anyone that far away before Warp Drive was created, so he had to be from Earth, so minus one point. Usually Spock has these numbers right since McCoy is a medical doctor. Obviously he watched First Contact, so let's do the math. This episode takes place in the year 2267 AD. 150 years ago it was 2117 when Zephyr Cochran was 87, which means he was born in the year 2030, 10 years from now. Star Trek First Contact takes place in the year 2063, which means Zephram Cochran was 33. So these numbers add up. Side note, this guy was born in the year 2112. Looks like this is too much for her to bear, but it's true. I went to Zephram Cochran High School. She still doesn't believe me. This is called age discrimination. Didn't he know Scotty did the same thing? Well, probably not. He said this because his favorite movie is Star Trek IV. How do you feel? How do you feel? And I will have to take a point from Dr. McCoy for using Fahrenheit instead of Celsius, then talking about his patient to Kirk within her earshot and scaring the living shit out of her. If you ever find me with only a few hours left, please give me tons of happy pills. I won't mind. It's not like I'll complain later. The secret is out. The companion brought them to keep Cochrane company. And it's just a little too much for the ambassador. This is why you're supposed to pump her up with happy pills. Usually McCoy shoots them up quick. Why didn't he do it this time? This is the best shot I have of the picture on the wall. Kirk wants Spock to find a way off the ship and discusses with Cochran if he wants to go with him. Spock uses the magic tool that does whatever the script tells it to. The companion knocks out Spock and sets fire to the control panel. They're screwed now. Here's another good shot of the painting. And I should show concern for her too, I guess. Kirk asks Cochran if the companion can cure the ambassador. The request surprises McCoy so much, he has to let out a really good fart. Kirk and Cochran are getting into some really personal conversation here. How could they say that on 60s TV? The Companion and Cochran merge together. If the network knew what they were really doing, this show would have never aired. No, that's not what they're doing at all, Kirk. We know why he's drained, but we can't talk about that on TV. And unfortunately, he has to give out the bad news. And it turns out this is a new Galileo 7 after all. This is an unusual scene. Most of the time, McCoy and Spock bicker about something. But this time, McCoy makes a suggestion to Spock, and he agrees. Spock describes how this machine will neutralize the companion while Kirk tugs his shirt. Actually, it can fail. Cochran is upset about this, of course. As you can see, he says, it's taken care of me all these years. Then Kirk points out, it's also keeping you prisoner. What that means, he's married. This scene, in a nutshell, means their plan went terribly wrong. A reminder that hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Bones tries talking to it, Cochran calls it away, and then Spock turns off the machine. So the companion must still be in quite a bit of pain while Cochran is drawing it away. This is the part where Kirk feels sorry for himself and McCoy butters him up. Aww. Cochran has a nice collection of robot toys on his desk. Minus one point here for not trying the Universal Translator first. Even Spock says that's not what it's for. Picard would have tried this approach first, that's for sure. Now we're going to take a brief look at what's going on board the Enterprise. This places metamorphosis right before Operation Annihilate. In a nutshell, the Enterprise is at the rendezvous point, but no sign of the shuttlecraft. And now they have to look for it. In this episode, Kirk, Spock, and McCoy don't set foot on the Enterprise at all. This piece of plumbing is the Universal Translator. Theoretically, they have it with them every time they go on a mission. It is hardly ever seen, but without it or the transporter, Star Trek would be an impossible series to make. Which means that even though they are nearly the most impossible pieces of technology to create in the future, you can't really take a point away for using them. And now they're going to try to talk to the companion. They should have tried this the first time. If you notice, they give the companion some romantic background music. Here you can see the special effects light moving around. How can we communicate? They're like, holy crap, that's a female cloud. So it's not a zookeeper that's keeping him prisoner, it's a lover. Didn't this happen in misery? This is why they have so many problems communicating with the cloud, since they are arguing with a woman. 
He's like, there's going to be a lot of negative comments posted about that. Kirk tries to explain it to the companion, but the companion isn't having it. She sees it only one way. Her way. And now after arguing with the companion, Spock has to use his logic about the whole thing. Kirk's like, not now, Spock. I will not comment on the shape of the Universal Translator. So here comes a remarkable comment from Captain Kirk. After 300 years, science has concluded that there are two genders, and it is a universal constant. So on Earth they finally started this discussion out. Or, scientific advancement in prenatal genetic testing and pro-choice met head-on. I'm going to get tons of comments on that one, I'll bet. And now here is the most controversial content of this episode. Read closely what they say. Kirk, Spock, and McCoy, all three, tell Cochran that the companion is female and that those two are lovers. Cochran says, no way, that's icky, that's gross, since he is definitely old school. And then the three amigos explain to him that it's a perfectly acceptable relationship. Of course, if you take out the fact that the companion kept him hostage on the planet for 150 years. But Cochran won't have it. So, is this conversation the closest the original Star Trek got to producing a gay rights show? Was that the intention? Of course, Cochran is very upset about this idea since he's old school. And Spock says, fascinating, he's old school. Looks like Kirk is thinking about Ruth. Ms. Hedford is about to die. Her last words, she has never been loved. Aww. This is a great shot of the Enterprise, even though very little of the show takes place on the ship. Mainly, they are still searching. Kirk tries to communicate with the companion one more time in an effort to leave the planet and save the ambassador. I guess I will have to take a point, since Spock not once went back to the shuttlecraft to repair the damage. This episode probably has Kirk rationalizing the most with an alien in all of the original series. He is definitely doing a Picard style, now that his original attempt to short it out didn't work. This isn't completely true. This is Kirk's way of saying he's going to be really bored on this planet. So instead of letting the shuttle go, the companion merges with Nancy Hedford. It's the only way for the companion to get rid of the fatal disease. But now they can never separate and she can't leave the planet either. Cochran is a little scared of her at first. If you notice, Nancy Hedford actually gets shafted in this show. She didn't get a vaccination for the rare disease. No one on the planet had a vaccination for her. Then the companion brings him to this planetoid to stay with Cochran forever. Then Nancy's consciousness is pretty much pushed aside by the companion, and now she's stuck on this planet for the rest of her life. This is an unusual statement. Even the companion has a religion. And she fakes the shuttlecraft. Now they're going to run off and do things they can only do during the commercial break. She looks a little worn out now. But in reality, they do a lot of bonding. And this is how the companion always saw Cochran. Another excellent shot of the Enterprise coming to the rescue. Here are a few shots of Uhura, Scotty, and Sulu, who only had a few lines in the show, but they were successful in their mission. Cochran makes a grammatical error here. It should be, there are a thousand planets, not there is a thousand planets. Now comes the big secret, she can't leave. And there's always that big question on how far away from the planet she can go, since they never say how far away the shuttle was when the companion picked them up. Yes, Zephram, she's Pinocchio. It looks like Cochran has made his decision. Yes! This screenshot turned out pretty good. But when it shows up, Cochran and Nancy both say they are staying behind. And according to Spock, they will age naturally again. So I guess the companion lost a lot of its powers in the merger. Just look at that happy couple. Aww. Now comes the hard part, since Cochran doesn't want his presence known. And Kirk has to explain to Starfleet why they lost an ambassador. And they still need to stop a war going on. And why does he say they need a woman to negotiate? And they all live happily ever after. So, who were the companions? Elizabeth Rogers was the voice of the companion. We will see her one more time in Star Trek. Glenn Corbett served in the Navy and has more than 60 credits to his name, including Route 66, Dallas, and The Doctors. Eleanor Donahue has spent her whole life on television with 100 screen credits to her name, including Father Knows Best, The Andy Griffith Show, and Get a Life. According to IMDb during the reshoot of this episode, she had pneumonia, so she really was sick after all. And Metamorphosis gets a whopping score of 92%. Not only was it one of the more cerebral episodes of season 2, the timeline matches with the movie First Contact. Leave your comments below, was this episode secretly pushing a gay rights issue into the script? Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists, click that like button, the share button, and that subscribe button, and I will see you again real soon. 
This week on Star Trek, scientists meet woman made of light. Next week on Star Trek The Next Generation, scientists meet woman made of light. And coming up in two weeks on Battlestar Galactica, this scientist meets these women made of light. Check it out.